acclaimed composer, multi-instrumentalist, and Silk Road Ensemble member Karu Watanabe grew up in St. Louis playing classical flute and went to college to become a jazz musician. But when he heard the sound of traditional Japanese taiko drumming, he felt an immediate connection to the music and to his heritage. I went to see the group that I eventually joined, Kodo, at Carnegie Hall, and then feeling this innate connection to the music. It was just hitting all my senses at once. I felt every hair on my arms and my neck were raising, and I felt tears welling up. It was just such a powerful, uh, visceral experience for me. It kind of shook my world. You're listening to Speaking Soundly, a backstage pass to today's biggest stars of the music world. I'm your host, David Krause, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with inspiring performers about their creative process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. You're known around the world as a specialist in the shinobue, which is a Japanese transverse flute, but you were raised with classical music and studied jazz in college. How did you juggle all of those interests and how did you end up musically where you are today? Yes. So I grew up uh, in St. Louis playing classical flute, having parents both in the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and, and really being immersed in that through high school. I was studying orchestral classical flute. Then I went to Manhattan School of Music to study Black American jazz music. So the focus was on John Coltrane, Miles Davis, you know, Duke Ellington, and trying to understand what the music was about, I realized that you can't separate culture and music. It's inauthentic. It's superficial to just study the notes and the scales and the harmony without knowing where the music comes from. And in this case, me as a Japanese American kid playing Black American music and feeling the disconnect there forced me to to dig deeper into who I was as a person, where my heritage lies. I felt like uh, imposter syndrome or or feeling like I was on the outside looking in or just kind of uh, appropriating someone else's culture, you know, without really having that connection that many of my friends and fellow classmates and, and teachers and, and mentors did. So you were in a competitive music conservatory playing music that you felt no connection to. What was it like as a musician, but also what was it like as a student? At the time, I felt, oh, man, I suck. I'm not getting the feel. I don't feel like I'm swinging hard enough. Reflecting that, I think, is just a lack of practice. But at the time, I I think I misconstrued that as I didn't grow up in the black church playing this music. And the fact was, I didn't grow up listening to the music. So I was very late coming to the game. And so me not having kind of this this fundamental understanding of the music and of the rhythm and of the feel, uh, I perhaps misconstrued that as... Um, just because I wasn't part of that culture. And that stemmed, that, that's what sent me on the, the journey of really trying to figure out what is the connection between heritage and music. Right. And so if it wasn't jazz, what was the music that you found you could connect to? When did you, when did you finally hear that? I think it was my senior year of, of, of college when I went to see the group that I eventually joined, Kodo, at Carnegie Hall. And then feeling this innate connection to the music. Hearing the sound of the instruments, hearing the shouts that they did. It it felt like, oh, I could do those shouts, even though I've never done those shouts. I felt like it would fit into my my body. They're known for um, very physical drumming. I remember uh, they're hitting this drum that's placed on its side with very large and heavy sticks. Uh, each stick is maybe a foot and a half long um, and like the, the thickness of a baseball bat. And they're hitting the drum clearly with all their might. And they're doing these extended drumming improvisations in this very, very strenuous position, hitting each hit as pretty much as hard as they could. And they were hitting it with incredible precision, incredible physical stamina. It's like they're running a marathon while playing a piece. You can hear nuance and and dynamics as well. It was incredibly musical, incredibly physical, and as well as very graceful. Even though they're hitting pretty much with all their weight and all their might, the bachi, the sticks, were were, um, were just kind of floating around and wrapping around their their body. Um, It almost seems like their arms would get tangled up, but it was just done so eloquently and so gracefully. So there's this incredible 
mix of, of brute force and pure elegance. It was just hitting all my senses at once. And then as the piece progressed, they started to hit even harder and they went even faster. And I just, I felt every hair on my arms and my neck were raising and I, I felt tears welling up. It was just such an, a powerful uh, visceral experience for me. I remember thinking I, I, I just needed to know what that was about. Like where, where does that come from? That sort of intensity. And, and so it's also this extreme of feeling very oddly familiar, but also just completely mysterious. So I was just sitting there reading the program notes, watching this music and dance and singing unfold and feeling the sense of mystery and thinking somehow innately that this might be the key to me understanding a little bit about who I was and where I came from and what my relationship to music was. Both on an intellectual level and a very visceral level, it shook my world and my understanding of music to the core. Wow. So you have this life-altering experience in Carnegie Hall, and then you're standing on 57th Street. Then what do you do? Uh, I was with friends, and, and I was in a state of euphoria and telling people, I'm going there. I'm, that's where I'm going. And everyone's like, you can do it. You can do it. Like, that's literally what people are saying. And that's exactly what you did, right? Yes. You picked up from New York, went to Japan, and started this apprenticeship. That's a huge move. What was that experience like? How did it compare with your music conservatory training? Well, uh, how does it compare? I think it's uh, <laughs> easier okay. to... Does it even compare? <laughs> does it compare? Um, well, yeah, perhaps this is very different from what, what I was doing at Manhattan School of Music. I remember at the very beginning of the apprenticeship, we would spend much more time in the rice fields. It was a springtime. So that was the time when it was most important to prepare the field. It took a lot of time to clear the field, um, get the water at the right height for the rice field, the rice paddy, I guess you would call it. Um, and so we were spending a lot of time in the mud and more time preparing this field than we were practicing or studying music or learning how to dance. Um, and at, at the beginning, it, it, it was a little frustrating. And it's like, I didn't come here for, to, to be in the rice field all day. Um, but like you, like, you know, like in the movies in Karate Kid, when, you know, you wax the car and you paint the fence, it slowly starts to dawn on you the whole function of, of working in a rice field, how to keep your balance, how to pull your foot out of mud and then place again while you're holding tools and, and seeds and chopping stalks of rice that informs your body about balance and about weight distribution um, and about the, the shape of your foot as you're pulling it out of the mud. And so these are things that you start to put into your body. And then when we start to learn the dance, it's very easy to kind of um, apply those lessons and then develop this different sense of how you transfer your weight, how you lift your legs, how you squat down into the ground. Um, and, it, and it translates very directly into the dances, which means it'll translate very directly into the rhythms of the drums and the rhythms of the flutes and of the melodies. It's all completely in interconnected. It was just such a holistic, from the ground up form of training. It, it's as if we, in order to, to, you go to a conservatory and you have to learn how to make paper in order to write <laughs> notes on it. I mean, it's that level of, you know, where does it come from? Where are the roots of, of everything that we do? Right. Well, I read that you had to make your own sticks, your own drumsticks. What was that process like? Um, well, uh, now I'm ashamed to say we did not start with cutting down the tree, but... <laughs> We started off with a block of wood. We take a, a wood plane. And then so you start pulling and uh, shaving uh, until you make the square piece of wood into an octagon. And then 16 sides. Then you make it into hopefully 32 sides until you have a round, um, yeah, a round cylinder. So we all ended up with these lumpy, not perfectly cylindrical pieces of wood because we're all pretty much new at it. And then we took those, those bachi, and then we went into the practice hall, and we started drumming. And after about two hours, everybody's bachi were pretty much covered in blood because most people weren't trained drummers at that point. And um, so our brand new bachi were soon drenched in blood. So it was a pretty, um, yeah, we just dump, jumped right into the, the deep end of it, right from day one. Wow, that's intense. Um you went from an apprentice to being a member of the ensemble, and that can't be an easy task. 
how long does it take to become a member? What was that? What was that like? It's a two-year program, and so you spend the first year uh, doing, uh, you know, learning the basics and and trying to make your way through it, and 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 also building up stamina and strength. Uh, it's very intense. Um, the first part of every day was running six miles, so it's a very physically intensive um, workout. And then from there, all the the drumming and dancing was very physical, very grueling. But then on the days that we're not doing the drumming, we might have tea ceremony, which seems very peaceful and uh, gentle. But then that means you're kneeling for two hours straight. And so that can be considered as torture for, for many people, you know, just um, so even days when you're doing tea ceremony, it's actually you have to really kind of build up your uh, your um, enthusiasm to, to make it through the, the day. Um, and then we also studied theater traditions, which also involved a lot of kneeling a lot of uh, very intense singing with the, the teacher kind of berating you at every phrase, old school ways of studying. By the second year, every couple months, you're doing a, a recital for the members of the group. Um, and then at the end of the two-year program, one or two, or depending on the year, zero uh, people are accepted to become probationary members of the group. And then uh, you're selected to become a member or not. Um, so yeah, I went from being at Manhattan School of Music to uh, living in Tokyo for a few months uh, and then moving to Sado and spending two years in the woods in Sado. Um, and then on my first tour back in the United States, I was playing at Carnegie Hall. So it was like, you know, two years after I saw that performance, I went back as a member of the group. It's amazing. When you look back to your trying to find a connection with music that you didn't find in jazz, what was it specifically about this music that was deeply entrenched in your DNA? I would say a lot of it is just the sound of your, your voice. I mentioned the shouting that people do in Japan, and there's, there's, very, there's both very formal forms of shouting called kakegoe, used in no theater, kabuki theater, as well as just the kind of general shouting that they would do in a festival or, you know, to, to rile up um, energy and, and enthusiasm. Um, and just how it fits in the body. It, it, when I saw it in at Carnegie Hall when I was in college, uh, it, it felt like a shout that I could do. It really resonated with me, is, is how, you know, growing up and, and listening to jazz and hip-hop and pop music and, and hearing how people sing it's like oh that doesn't I don't think I could ever be a, a pop singer I could never be a, a rapper <laughs> but when I heard that I think oh I could I if I not even necessarily the singing but just the, the, the vocalization and the shouting it's like that that's not that sounds something that I could I could feel in my voice that I could feel in my body that inspiration is is evident when you play because I've watched a concert video of you performing a piece of yours called Incense. Not only are you playing a plethora of instruments, but you are manipulating your laptop, which you're making loops on. You're creating, you're reacting, you're producing and engineering all in a split second. And the result is amazing. How are you able to do that? It was not easy. Um... Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> You could do it too. It just takes practice. Um, it's it's. Uh, I, I practice the 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 technology. I spend as much time on that as as I have doing scales and practicing rudiments in my life. You know, just doing it over and over and over and again, and you know, and making a lot of mistakes, forgetting to reset the 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 gain, or you know, forgetting where I put the, my sticks. You know, okay, I need to always have my sticks here. Always have my flutes here. So even if I wanted to be free with it, at least I know where the instruments are. <laughs> you know, some really very basic things like that. Um, but then also just, yeah, it, it, it really took and is still taking a lot of refinement. I'm still trying to compose for that, meaning I'm, I'm kind of creating these new structures and these new, um, and I'm currently working on some commissions where I'm using this technology as well. So I'm, I'm currently composing and, and trying to, invent new ways even new ways to um to 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 work on this it's um yeah it's 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 just repetition like like you know you understand right just repeat doing it over and over again and 
getting comfortable with it and and um it's it's been uh it's like learning a whole new instrument starting two years ago and that was recorded here in new york city right at at joe's pub yes so let me ask you when you have an audience that comes in and just wants to be entertained maybe they don't even really know what they're about to hear they have a two drink minimum and they just want to hear a set how do you break the ice musically like do you consider how you want to introduce them to your music I kind of have two answers for that. One is uh, I have a an instrument that I use called hyoshigi, and the hyoshigi are, are simply wood blocks. Um, but the hyoshigi that I have are, are they're oak and they're very heavy. It's it's almost impossible to record that instrument. If you hear it in person, the sound just it splits your ear and it goes straight into your brain. It's very loud and very piercing. Um, you can't really tell in a recording the the effect of it. Um, but I, I often use it at the beginning of my performances. And it's used often traditionally in kabuki theater or at the beginning of festivals to indicate when the, the procession will begin, for example. Um, it's the it, it kind of it kind of purifies or sanctifies the air. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I use it at the beginning of the show as well. It it kind of it helps me focus. It helps. It brings the audience like very clearly to attention and kind of lets them know that something is about to happen and that that we're suddenly transformed. We're in a different space right now. Um, so that that's that's kind of the first part of that. Um, the hyoshigi. Um, but the hyoshigi, by the way, uh, that's the sound that I woke up to every morning during the apprenticeship at uh, five fifty a.m. <laughs> in the winter in Sado Island. One person would would ring the wooden clappers in the morning walking up and down the hallways. Um, and so that's the beginning of the day. That means, okay, it's time to get up. It's time to focus. It's time to go run your six miles <laughs> and do your training. Um, so it, it has a very visceral kind of uh, effect to my to my psyche, um, my mentality. Um, but having said that, I'm still very like, okay, where are my sticks? <laughs> Is the gain at <laughs> the right level? Yeah, I'm trying to be completely in the moment and kind of lost in this world of, of these these instruments and the beauty of these instruments that that the sound that they're able to create. But I'm also very practical, trying to remember the cues and listen to the click when I have to, and and you know try to stay um, uh, on point even as I'm being expressive and trying to be completely feeling lost in the moment while being in control. Hmm. Another big aspect of your artistry is your ability to collaborate with others. You do it a lot in your compositions and in your ensemble work. And that brings up a word that sometimes is cringed at, which is fusion. It's cringed at both musically and in the food world. Because if you don't pull it off, it's it's terrible. How do you try to make your collaborations work as well as, say, like a, an awesome kimchi mm. taco would? <laughs> the food analogy is perfect. Like I, I use that analogy all the time. Um, my partner's a trained chef. She's not a chef by trade, but she is trained professionally. Um, and so we talk about this all the time as well. Sushi is such a great example. It's like anybody could take rice and put a cut of fish on it and puts wrap it in seaweed, right? But it's, it's, and it's such a simple thing to make, but it, there's so many layers of depth and, and right. And to get the right temperature and the right, moisture and the right cut and the right selection of fish and the right type of rice and the right type of water that you're going to wash the rice. How do you wash the rice? How do you cook the rice? Um, And so the idea of if you do want to experiment with sushi, go ahead. But without the basic, basic fundamental understanding of making good sushi, right, um, it's going to be hard to to do that. And so what I try to do is uh, make sure that I, I'm always picking the right water and the right types of rice and then the right and then if I'm going to deviate from that, deviate in a very conscious and a very uh deliberate way, using again, trying to really experiment but but keeping a very just very conscious decisions. And I appreciate like the people that I work with and the mentors that I have who keep instilling that in myself. You know to really try to go deep, try to always retain that authentic flavor. Right. So there's this great 
performance video I watched of you playing the Japanese flute and you found yourself near a stream somewhere in Denver. Yeah. And you're just playing off of the sounds that you're hearing from that stream and in nature. And it reminded me of a performance that Yo-Yo Ma did where he's sitting in the woods playing the cello amongst the bird song and reacting to that. Both of you can take nature from the outside and bring it into your music. How does the natural world inspire and inform your creative process? Okay, that's another hour-long discussion. Um, <laughs> Sorry, well, how about just a yes or no answer? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I mean, it, we've already talked about it a bit, talking about um, studying the traditional dances and working in a rice field, right? And how they're complete, they're, they're just intrinsically linked, right? The, the understanding of mud, walking in mud and growing rice, planting rice, how that breaks your back in a way and how that relates to how you're going to move when you're doing a dance. The dance itself is a prayer to gods for a good harvest. And so in my training, in my fundamental training, it's coming directly out of nature, right? Uh, studying the festival music of Japan. So I've studied various uh, regional festival musics and even the festivals, even the, the date, when is the festival going to happen in this year has to do with cosmology, where, where the stars are, where, where we are, you know, in terms of the, the, planets orbiting around the sun and the priests all know they can do the calculations and know when the festival needs to be held in order to also tell us when is the, the right time to harvest or when is the right time to plant you know so on that scale it's it's directly tied to all the japanese traditional music that i've studied so the idea of making sticks with your own hand makes you respect the tree that it comes from right cutting the bamboo i play i'm holding bamboo instruments every day and and being very respectful of the bamboo and being respectful of the the, the animal hides. I, I'm close friends with the people who make my flutes, with the company, the people that make my drums, and they speak about the appreciation and awareness of the animals, the trees that they had to cut down to create a, a drum. You know, they have to cut down a tree that's hundreds and hundreds of years old, and being aware of that, being conscious, being thankful, and being humbled by that. These are all things that have been strongly instilled in me over my time studying this music. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speaking Soundly. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at speakingsndly and visit our website, artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly. 